Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 20, The Good, The Bad, and The Boy's Home, with guest Josiah Wright. I'm Mark Kane. This podcast is the audio tentacle of the Unitarian Christian Alliance. Ooh. It's to encourage and connect Unitarian Christians, different than Unitarian Universalists. Quite different. We Unitarian Christians believe that when you're counting gods, then shalt thou count to one, no more, no less. One shall be the number thou shalt count, and the number of the counting shall be one. Three shalt thou not count, neither count thou two, excepting that thou then proceed to count backwards to arrive again at one. Four, four is right out. Once the number one being the first number be reached, then declarest thou that the one beeth the Father, the Maker of heaven and earth, the God of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. (laughs) If you're not a Unitarian Christian, you're welcome to stay for a cup of tea. Rest assured, there are no killer rabbits here. I hope you enjoyed last week's podcast. Based on the feedback, I may have to invite Doubting Thomas back for an interview. Hmm. If you haven't heard it, I invite you to take it in. Sean Finnegan from Restitutio gave that episode's unique approach to apologetics a name. Counterfactual Historical Reconstruction. (laughs) Here I was, imagining what it might have been like if the disciples had discovered it was Yahweh who died, just having fun. And Sean comes along and ruins it with an intellectual-sounding label. (laughs) Okay, it's actually quite clever. And I'm proud to consider myself a counterfactual historical reconstructionist. Josiah Wright is a young man. He's 24, married, and has two children. He's packed a lot into his relatively few years. Not all of it is what you'd write home to mom about. He's had some challenging times. But he kept pressing forward and seeking God, earnestly desiring more. Today, I suspect his honesty and transparency will help many to recognize how God can work on someone's heart, how God can see one through the darkness and out the other side. Josiah, thank you for joining me today. Good to be here. I met you not long after the podcast started. I got to hear a little bit about your background, and there clearly was an interesting story tucked away in there. So why don't we start out with the who you are, the backstory, your family, that sort of thing. Yeah. I was born in Kansas and we moved directly to Colorado, Uh, moved back to Kansas uh, around eight years old. And I got sent to Missouri to a boy's home for misbehaving in a lot of ways I'd love to get into later. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I wouldn't love to. I would love to tell the story in case it helps somebody. (laughs) Okay, okay. But I got sent to a a boy's home in a very, very, very small town. It was even called a village, under 200 people. And uh, and if you count the dogs, it's just barely over 200 people. But Oh, wow. What does it mean that you're in a boys' home? What what are they doing there? So most boys' home were for correctional purposes. So instead of getting sent to a juvenile hall, sometimes you can get court ordered to a boys' home or just your parents want to send you there. Mm. Some kids just are completely rebellious going off the chain. And so their parents are desperate for help. And so they send them to a place like this. And there's quite a few out there. There needs to be a lot more. Mm. So to sum it up, it's a place you can send your kid that you've lost hope on in hopes that they will learn some good things and make a change in their life where they might have been going down the tubes and headed for prison. Mm, I see. So is was this particular home, was it a Christian-run facility? Yes. The facility was very fundamental Baptist, independent Baptist, King James only. Okay. Um, if I say anything that sounds like I don't have respect for that place, I have the utmost respect. Mm. Um, I, I'd like to talk later about how I had to leave um, based on theological reasons, but I still had Thanksgiving with them last year, so <laughs> we're on good terms. <laughs> they even sent the guy to help me move, so it's it's uh, and it wasn't a get out of here type of thing. <laughs> they're they're very awesome people. Good, we set that make that clear. It's not a hit piece on <laughs> right because <laughs> I would love for them to hear this. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you spent some time at the boys' home, and then you went back again to have a job there. Yeah. At first, I, I had a job there, kind of just transitioned right in there from being in the program. Okay. And then went back there after I left for about seven months. So, I mean, I really, really, really enjoyed being there. That's cool. So you stayed on because you felt that you could contribute to the other boys that came as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wanted them to uh, have a better chance just like I did. 
Mm, that's cool. Well, let's pause and back up. How was it you ended up sent to a boys' home? <laughs> so I went to a private school for a couple of years. I took first grade and kindergarten together, and then my parents decided to homeschool me kind of when that was getting popular. Mm. I got to about fifth grade, and I gave my parents so much trouble over school. I was plenty smart enough. I was just so lazy <laughs> that <laughs> she was like, you know, if, if you don't want to do school, just go work. I've had it. Wow. So through that, I went and hung out with all the wrong friends. Mm. Let me say that a different way. They, they're good friends. They were a bad influence on me. Mm. If that makes any sense. They were good old country boys. Yeah. So I got pretty heavy into drinking. And really before that, the biggest problem was pornography. I mean, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and to where I was doing things that were not right at all. Mm. That truly does send people to prison just because it escalates. Mm. Uh, obviously, it does not happen to everybody that watches pornography, but it can really work on people. Actually, a close friend I had got sent to prison for that wow. shortly after I got sent to the boys' home. Um, besides drinking, I was chewing a lot of tobacco, and uh, I was underage, so that was illegal, but also it causes cancer, and it's not something my parents wanted me to do under their roof. So mm. they they tried and tried and tried and tried to get me to stop misbehaving, and they couldn't, so they sent me to this boys' home. Mm -hmm. So my grandpa, he was a very respected Baptist pastor in Kansas that still to this day, his congregation just absolutely loves him. Mm. And then my dad, he really went off the deep end. <laughs> I mean, he he's the best guy you could ever meet. He would be totally fine with me sharing this, but he really went off the deep end and, and came back to God when he hit rock bottom. Mm. And so I have kind of the Baptist background, but he is a Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. He's not happy about me being a biblical Unitarian, but we're still have a great relationship. That's good. Has a little tension sometimes, but that's expected. <laughs> he told me growing up, you're going to change your mind and we're going to disagree about things and that's going to be okay. Huh. So wow. for a little bit, it wasn't okay, but uh, it is now. <laughs> it is, it's okay now. <laughs> oh, wow. So grew up kind of with the Baptist framework, somewhat Calvinist without predestination. Mm. Let me say something before I continue. This isn't to bash or use a platform against dispensationalism or Calvinists or anything like that. Anything I say just means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that talking to other dispensationalists, that even though I strongly disagree, I know that it means a lot to them for specific reasons. I'm open to the truth if God shows it to me. Mm. I just want to make sure that nobody thinks I'm using this as a platform to, <laughs> to bash <laughs> anybody else. I appreciate that. So... I grew up believing in the Trinity, believing in once saved, always saved, but we didn't really talk about it a lot. He was more focused on practical application in life of following God. Okay. I came with that background, a biblical background, so got sent to the boys' home. Obviously, they're <laughs> Southeast Missouri, um, fundamental Baptists. They're pretty conservative, too. Yeah. So you end up at the home. How was that like? Did they make a difference right away? Did it take a long time? Yeah, so I was really relieved when I went there because, and not to bash my parents at all, but they were constantly nagging me to do better. And obviously, mm. <laughs> they're my parents. <laughs> I mean, they <laughs> as, <laughs> they should. <laughs> but when I got there, he expected me to do wrong. He expected that I got sent there for a reason. And when I say he, I'm talking about the director of the boys' home. Oh, okay. So it was kind of a relief to not feel all the pressure to change. And that really let me unwind, just kind of get my bearings and it was very structured. Every morning we got up at six, got ready for the day in 30 minutes, and then we had Bible reading for 30 minutes, and we went and had breakfast. We'd clean the building after that, and then we would have school, depending on what day it was, or maybe we'd have work projects if it was Saturday. We had chapel every night or church on Wednesday, and then church twice on Sunday, and it was an, actually an open church, so it wasn't just us. Multiple people came to. Okay. So then your struggles, did it change for you at this point? Were you able to improve or get past some of these? So it, it felt like it because I was away from everything. Mm. Um, the lust, obviously, that will stick with you if you're in a dark padded room because you can think about that in your mind. Um, mm. But the drinking, the tobacco, the sneaking out. I mean, you can sneak out. We did have some guys run away, and that was always fun to <laughs> track them down because they usually ended up being quite the character afterward. It was always pretty cool to see people. Um, afterward. <laughs> but <laughs> so it seemed like I was helped because I was away from the physical drinking all the time and, and tobacco and partying and sneaking out. Mm. But when I started graduating out of the program and had more time on my hands and got my own vehicle and had a day off, that everything just kind of started back up. 
Hmm. So as soon as I got a phone, pornography started back up. As soon as I had access to a gas station, I, I got right back into all the fleshly desires that I had. And it was very, very, very depressing. Um, hmm. It was a very long period of time because I got out of the program about a year and a half into it. I was an intern slash staff for a couple of years, really, before I met my wife. I had my ups and downs. I'd hit rock bottom, um, repent. They, they didn't talk about repentance, but I would be so sorry for the way I was living and try to do better. And I just went up and down, up and down for a couple of years. It was very depressing and got very low and cut myself pretty often. I cut words that said hypocrite and liar and cheater and thief and all kinds of terrible things that the devil really just messed with me and I messed with myself. Mm. <laughs> it just, it was pretty bad. Wow. So during this dark period of time, you were still participating and working at the boys' home and like attending the churches and all these things. This was just a secret depression for you or was this something you were getting help for? Yeah, it was definitely a secret. I would sometimes tell the the director, you know, I'm I'm having troubles with this stuff and he was very gracious. There was a couple times he thought I was just saying something cuz I was afraid I was getting caught, <laughs> but oh. I think he got that I was really struggling with this stuff and I was really open with him the whole time when I was in the program and and after. Mm -hmm. He tried to help by saying, you know, eventually you're going to get better. You need to just keep trying and he did help me in a lot of ways, especially with just being responsible in life and money management and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff that was, it was really good. But I feel like just trying hard over and over and over again never worked. I would do good for a little bit and just plummet right back into it. Mm. So knowing you now, I know that you've come through this. Let's talk about how that came about. What happened next that changed things? So uh, we took the guys to a Baptist camp every year. And it's not like a fun camp where you go rafting and do ropes courses or anything like that. Okay. I mean, we play volleyball and softball, but this is more of a camp where you hear preaching all morning long, you eat some food, you hear preaching all afternoon, or you play some games in the afternoon, then you hear preaching all evening, and you do that for about four days. And it was pretty good, but it's very solid, very Southern fundamental Baptist preaching. So it's pretty intense. <laughs> okay. Um, it got pretty loud there, but <laughs> I was staff, um, cause this is probably, oh, I'd say four years into being there, mm -hmm. you know, all the girls there just really, you know, they kind of had to be there. They weren't really super, you know, they weren't wife quality. And that's kind of what I was wanting at that point. I considered myself an adult <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, you know, the next step, I don't really want to mess around with dating. Although I want to date my wife, obviously I want to get to know her, but I don't want to just mess around. I'd rather just get married and have kids and start my life off. So yeah. I wasn't interested in any of them. So I was like, you know, God, I've got plenty of issues and, and obviously they've got some issues. I'll just listen to the preaching and just be a good boy and not worry about it. And when it's your timing, it's your timing. So okay. apparently it was his timing right then. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife was sat right behind me and she normally didn't go to the camp, but she went to this camp with her friend and sat right behind me and she was cutting up and giggling behind me. And I was like, whoa, I, I think I want to get this girl's number. And so <laughs> one of the guys egged me on, so you won't do it. So I did do it. So I'm in his debt. Anyway. Yeah. I met my wife and life got a lot better because I wanted, I was afraid if I started disrespecting God that, you know, if this was his will, maybe he would take it away. So I, I started to do better. And that is when mm. I got out of the main depression. She really made my emotions come back alive. And, and uh, in a lot of ways, she, she fulfilled a lot of things that I didn't know needed fulfilled. It sounds like it wasn't just about you anymore. There was somebody else involved and that kicked it up a notch like, oh, you know, these things in my life, they aren't as pressing. You mm -hmm. have other interests, that that kind of thing? Yes, um, emotionally. Okay. But I still struggled. I went eventually went back to all of them physically. Okay. The drinking, not so much because it's harder to hide. But mm. uh, definitely, you know, while we were dating and after we got married, it wasn't near as bad when we got married, but it was still, you know, still doing things behind her back that definitely shouldn't. And okay. still working at the boys' home, it's like, you're a Christian, you're married, and you're working at a Christian boys' home. It's just not stuff you should be hiding from everybody. I was still pretty depressed, but mm. had a lot of other focuses that took my mind off the depression, I guess you could say. So you're still struggling with things. And like I mentioned before, I know you came out of it. <laughs> where did the magic, where did it happen? <laughs> so I had been reading a lot more 
in the Gospels about what Jesus said to do and how I was supposed to follow him. And at this point, still full-blown Baptist. Um, I, I guess I should back this up, too. They weren't full Cal- Calvinist either, okay. but they were mostly Calvinist. So with that frame in mind, they talk about following Jesus, and you need to follow Jesus, but you don't have to. If someone decides to go off the deep end, they're still going to heaven. If somebody listening doesn't know the background, if you were to ask them, you know, somebody turns away from God and becomes a drug addict or, or does some murder or, you know, all this other stuff, will they go to heaven? They would say yes, because they believed at one time. Okay. That's called once saved, always saved. Correct. Yes. Okay. And I don't know how you would know you were saved because also <laughs> this is not to bash at all, but it was very confusing for me because... If somebody in the home was really acting up, mm-hmm. the director would say, you know, I don't know if that person's actually saved because obviously in First John, anybody that's born again shouldn't make a habit of sinning. Okay. And to hear him say that was like in my own life, I was like, man, you know, <laughs> am I saved? Ah. And part of the altar calls were always, if you don't know you're saved, you can come up and pray this prayer, kind of a just in case type of thing to make you feel better. Okay. And it was just very confusing, very depressing. But when I was reading Jesus's words, he was saying, no, you have to follow me. You're not my disciple if you don't follow my words. Mm. And so that playing in the background, it wasn't any light bulbs or anything, but it really was reshaping my focus. And it led up to me praying more and more and really caring about what I was doing in the sight of God a lot more. And Mm. so I was praying a whole lot. (laughs) To me, it was a whole lot. It wasn't any more than 30 minutes at a time. There was this time where it it was my day (laughs) off. (laughs) My wife was gone Mm -hmm. hanging out with a friend. And so I was just like, just forget it. If if I'm going to have all these struggles and the Bible says who the sun sets free is free indeed, I'm not free indeed. Maybe this is all fake. I don't think it is because I've seen a lot of miraculous things with guys just turning their lives around. And, mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe this isn't real. So I, I'm just going to get in my closet like Jesus says to do, and I'm going to pray until he shows up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I'd kind of wow. done stuff like that before. There wasn't anything much different about this time except something happened this time. Okay. And I had been reading about what Jesus said to do about following him. Mm. So got in the closet. I prayed for three hours, and it just was the hardest. I, I felt like I fought demons the whole time. I fought myself. I fought just, it was a battle uh, for three hours straight. And okay. whether you believe in supernatural things or not, at the end of three hours, I heard a voice in my head that said, without faith, it's impossible to please me. And I had had faith. God heard my prayers. I had faith. <laughs> I, I was a believer. Mm. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure what was different about this faith, but I just all of a sudden believed that he was hearing me pray, requesting that he takes my sin away, takes my addiction away, makes me who I'm supposed to be. And a blue light, it looked like I was in outer space and a blue light shot from my heart to his heart. And I couldn't see him. I just felt like I knew that our hearts connected in some way. Mm. It was complete peace. Like I've never known before or really since then Mm. for another hour. I didn't know anybody was there. I didn't know where I was. I didn't really care. It's just the presence of God and me. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that, he said, I want you to start reading in the book of Matthew. And I started doing that for another couple hours. And like the scriptures just came alive like never before and all about repentance, wow. all about following Jesus, all about uh, how to be set free by following Jesus. And it just mm-hmm. was a complete game changer. Uh. I didn't realize till about a month later that I hadn't desired any of those things that I struggled with for years. Uh, so it was definitely, <laughs> definitely a whole life changer. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's amazing. So you, you came out of that prayer time and months went by before you truly realized the temptations and the, the sin wasn't present. Right. The longer it went, the more I realized that, wow, I, I am actually free. Because before, I always had the desire, but I would be able to stop myself for maybe a month or two. Mm. Um, but it was always just a real, real heavy burden and a heavy battle. Yeah. But this time, I didn't have desire at all. My desire was fully on God. I was just on fire mm. and in the Word constantly. I actually shared with a close friend that was working there, too. We were in the home together, and we graduated together. Yeah, uh, I shared with him, you know, what happened to me, what I was reading in the Word. And he's like, yeah, I've kind of noticed, too, that you know, there's a little more to this. We have to follow Jesus if we're going to be, quote-unquote, saved. And saved to us, we were finding out, was being whole. Mm. 
it was a pretty wild ride. We both had this small Gideon New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs that we carried in our pocket, and, and, and we were reading every spare second we had. If we were working in the school, yeah. sometimes there's like a two-minute break where nobody really needs help with their tutoring. So we would just be reading every single chance we could. So it was really exciting time. My walk was amazing, but what was happening was my theology was slowly changing. <laughs> um, <laughs> according to the Bible, I was not agreeing with a lot of the things I was hearing in the preaching. And everybody there was super, super humble. It wasn't like I could point at somebody and say, that person's a Pharisee. Like this whole this whole mindset is pharisaical. It was more like, man, I'm kind of torn apart because my life has changed, but it's because my theology has changed. And I see all these other guys that are kind of yeah, they're having a better life, but they're also still getting out of here and struggling with the same things. So, so at that point, the theological change that you're you're referencing, we haven't got to the Unitarian Trinitarian thing yet. Right. You're talking about theology related to following Jesus. Right. The real big thing that was changing for me is I really don't think once saved, always saved is is right, and it didn't come from any outside source. It, it didn't come from anything but me just praying and reading the Bible. I think it's what caused all my problems of not being able to overcome because it wasn't a necessary thing to get to heaven. My mentality didn't change to, oh, I have to be a good guy in order to get to heaven. It was, you can't really call yourself a disciple of Christ if you're not going to follow him. If eternal life is to know the Father and to know the Son, mm -hmm. you can't really know them without following them, and you can't really follow them without doing what they say. I know some people twist it to say, you know, you're doing works. That's one thing my dad's big on is you can't get to heaven by works, and that's what you believe, but it's not at all what I believe. I think if you call yourself a disciple, you have to do those things. Just like if you say you're in the army, you can't just <laughs> go AWOL and, and do whatever you want and go over to the Russian side. Like, no, you, <laughs> you have to do what the army says, otherwise you can't call yourself in the army. Mm. At this point, your theology change was on what salvation was, this once saved, always saved idea. How was that causing you a problem? Uh, maybe, you know, if it's correct, the way they were preaching it was holding me back because they were preaching, you are sinful by nature. Mm -hmm. You're going to sin every day. Nobody can help it. Even if you don't think you sinned, you did. I, I heard that countless times. You know, we all sin a yeah. hundred times a day. We don't even realize it. And so it really put a low expectation on myself subconsciously. Okay. And then the fact that you don't have to act like a Christian in order to be saved. That also subconsciously creates a big, big problem in your mind that, first of all, you're expected to, to do bad things. And second of all, it doesn't really make a difference if you do bad things or not. Mm. You'll still get to heaven as long as you claim that Jesus is Lord. Okay. And to me, the big thing that changed is claiming he's Lord is literally you make him your Lord. Mm-hmm. Later on, another staff member there that is still once saved, always saved in Trinitarian, he said, so what do you think about salvation? I kind of explained, well, like, Jesus has to be my Lord. He literally is my king. When he says jump, I say how high. <laughs> like, he literally, <laughs> like, anything he says goes in my life. He's like, oh, so that's lordship salvation because he's real theological and I was not. Okay. I was like, well, I, I guess. I was like, is that what you believe? He said, um, I mean, I think it's really maybe the best way to think about it, but no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of the end of that conversation. But huh. So w w with your theology changing, how did that impact your relationship then overall? I mean, you were still working at the home. Right. It really was changing my walk with God, and I was not about to throw that away for anything because okay. for one, I was free, but for two, I was walking way better with my wife, mm. way better with people around me. I had no depression whatsoever. I was very happy, oh, wow. and I was just all around a much better person. But I knew if I was to say right out, once saved, always saved, was wrong, the doctrine, I knew I would be immediately fired. I knew that was not acceptable. Mm. It wasn't like you preached, you must believe this, otherwise you're not a Christian. They didn't ever say anything like that, but I knew they held to it very strictly, okay. and so it, it was not something that I could budge on. So it affected my mm. walk in a very good way, but also a very uncomfortable way because basically I started sharing what happened to me with the guys. I know it was sneaky, but <laughs> I have a passion for helping people. And Yeah, and it helped you. Yes, it helped me. And <laughs> I wanted to share it, you know? Yeah, right. And these guys were struggling just like I was, a lot of times in much worse ways than I was. Mm -hmm. And they kept coming to me and saying, you know, I really cared about them. When you care about somebody, they know. 
So they'd come and talk to me and say, look, I'm struggling with this thing. You say that you don't struggle with that. And to my knowledge, every man lusts. So, you know, Mm -hmm. how, how does this happen for you? So I would tell them and say, look, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm not supposed to be talking like this. If you say what I'm saying to the director, you know, I'm, I'm going to be let go. Really read the Bible. Just, just get into the Word. Jesus has the words of life, and that's what you need right now is some life. It kind of felt like, you know, I could barely keep it to myself. Why would I expect them to keep it to themselves? <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It eventually comes out, right? It eventually yeah. came out. So I didn't know that it had come out, but several days after it had, I was talking to one of the guys about Once Saved, Always Saved in the nursery. He was done with his job. I was done inspecting jobs, and we were the only ones there. We ended up going too long, and we were late for lineup. So the director came, and he was not happy. Mm. And so he came in and busted it up. And so later on, he had a talk with me and said, you know, I've caught when this is what you believe. Is that really true? And I, was, I told him, you know, I, I think you have to follow Jesus. I don't think once I've always saved is right. And at that time, it, it was still pretty fresh. You know, it was several months old. Mm. I didn't really know exactly what to say. I was just like, I know the way I was living did not work. And this way does work. And I can't budge on that. So we had several meetings with him and the staff, some elder staff, uh, elders in the church. And ultimately with the pastor, he actually said, you know, we're not going to agree on this, but by the fear of God, we persuade men. So it, we'll just we'll just leave it at that. But since I didn't agree with the pastor, the director said, and and again, I, I don't want him to be in a bad light. He's a good guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, you know, if you're not going to agree with the pastor, you need to find a different church. Mm. Okay. I thought I was pretty much the only one that believed this way at this time. My wife was very mad <laughs> that I changed my mind on what saved, always saved. She was like, you know, we're married already. Um, and at that time, she was pregnant with our first kid. She's like, don't ever talk about this to me. And eventually, a couple weeks later, she said, you know, you can bring up the scripture, but I, I'm still not happy. And eventually she's like, yeah, you know, it makes sense. Okay. So basically I thought her and I were the only ones that thought this way. So kind of searched around online, trying to find somebody. Eventually found the Pentecostal church in town about 15 miles away. Didn't believe in what they'd always say. I didn't know anything about oneness. <laughs> mm. I didn't know anything about the, the spiritual gifts. I went there with a big list of questions like, do you do this according to the Bible? Do you believe once saved, always saved? And he straight up looked at me and said, no, I'm not a Calvinist. (laughs) So (laughs) we ended up going there and I just plunged right into the whole thing, all the theology. I read all David Bernard books and I was a very staunch oneness person. Um, But I will flash back. I don't want to get too far into that part of the story. Okay. When we found the new church, a couple of weeks after that, the director came and said, you know, I've heard you're going to a Pentecostal church and that's... If you're a Baptist, that's not (laughs) something you want to be known. (laughs) Mm. So uh, he said, you know, if you're going to go to a different church of of a completely different theological system than we believe, you can't really work here. That's unequally yoked. Mm. It it was February. By the end of February, I needed to be gone. So I had staff housing at that time. He let me stay there. He let me do some property care to stay in the house, which was very gracious of him. Yeah. Started going more full-time to the Pentecostal church. As I mentioned before, I got really far into it. I was just really excited about it. And if you've ever been to a UPC church, they're usually very upbeat. They love Jesus. They, I mean, Jesus is God to them. Yeah. He is the Father. He is the Son. He is the Holy Spirit, all wrapped up in Jesus. So I was just on fire. Still lived in staff housing till the end of the year. And by that time, we bought our first home. And an older guy in the church, he was a, a mechanic at a motorcycle dealership, and so he invited me to go work there because I love turning a wrench. I worked there with him. Uh, I guess that would be kind of the transition out of the boys' home and out of the Trinitarian and Baptist Calvinist framework into the modalist. <laughs> they never called mm-hmm. it modalism, but into the modalist and oneness Pentecostal framework. Okay. Given that you've been listening to this podcast and uh, and are a member of the Unitarian Christian Alliance, the oneness persuasion also did not stick. What happened there? As I said, I was full blown. I mean, I read tons of David Bernard books. He's kind of the king of of oneness at this time, in a lot of people's opinion, especially if you're in the UPC, uh, the United Pentecostal Church. They're huge. I'd never met a Pentecostal until that time, Mm -hmm. and most people have never heard of Oneness Pentecostals if they haven't been exposed to them, but there's a ton of them. 
I mean, you had the podcast with Dan Gill. He he was in the UPC as well. Mm-hmm. And so I started getting back in the Bible after I got real theological for a few months and read a ton of books. And mm-hmm. I really started seeing, you know, <laughs> there's a big difference between the Father and the Son. Like, obviously, I see the, the Trinity's wrong after they persuaded me. I was a little bit hesitant, mm. but, you know, I was wrong. I'm once saved, always saved in my mind. I was like, you know, I don't know, but what you guys are saying makes a lot of sense to why the Trinity is wrong. Okay. But, you know, the more I read the Bible, um, I wrote a little moped to work, and it took me about 40 minutes every day to get to work. So I listened to a good chunk of Scripture <laughs> every day, and it just was not lining up with, with oneness theology. Mm. So eventually, you know, through talking to a lot of them, none of the answers they were giving were making good biblical sense. And that was over a year, and I was so close to a lot of those guys. It was pretty hard to leave that situation as well, but I was praying a ton. I was like, you know, I feel like I'm the only one again that has another theological difference. And <laughs> like, you're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was so hard. I was like, you know, I see why this doesn't make sense. I see that the son is different than the father, but it does look like, you know, the proof texts that they're giving really make Jesus look like he's God, but it just doesn't make sense that he is the same as the Father, but the Trinity's wrong, so <laughs> what do I believe? Yeah, I feel like I'm the only one that doesn't believe Jesus is the Father, and I'm the only one that believes Jesus isn't co-equal with the Father. I was in between a rock and a hard place, just didn't know what in the world to think, and so I just started praying, and I gave up searching online. I actually could not find... Um, uh, anything Unitarian. I wasn't looking for Unitarian. I was looking for Jesus, not the Father. All I could find were debates between Oneness and Trinitarians. And so I don't know how I didn't find it. Huh. Um, maybe it was hidden from me for a certain time. I have no idea. But, you know, I was praying for a long time. And okay. I felt like I heard God say, this is going to be hard if you continue down the road. And I didn't know what to think about that. I was like, well, am I being rebellious? Mm. <laughs> is it just my own thoughts? Because sometimes you hear your own thoughts and you think it's God. And, or, or maybe people don't do that. Maybe I'm weird. <laughs> you might be the only one, Josiah. <laughs> <laughs> so I prayed a lot and I was like, you know, I've got to know the truth. I don't care how hard it is. So all of a sudden, one day I was listening to YouTube. To this day, I can't find the guy. He's not a Unitarian, but he basically said the same thing we do. He explained the very two verses I was struggling with, which gave me a big sigh of relief. And then the next video was a Dan Gill video. Ah. And immediately after they started talking about everything I had been thinking, I was like, wow, I am not alone. There's a whole (laughs) church that believes this. I got to find out where this church is. And (laughs) it was way far away from me, over three and a half hours at that point. So I was like, man, this this is a bummer. But I can't remember her name. She knows my name. I I went to to Dan Gill's church not too long ago, and she remembers. She's like, hey, I'm the one that you contacted. She pointed me in the right direction. She pointed me to Facebook groups, and she pointed me to several podcasts, and one of which was Sean Finnegan's Restitutio podcast Mm -hmm. that I listened to the snot out of. I just listened (laughs) to that thing all day. Because a lot of times I requested to work on the projects at the shop that were alone to where I could Mm. work and concentrate and listen at the same time. Uh huh. So, yeah, that's where my Unitarian uh, faith basis was based is on Sean. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I, I think I might take that line you used about the snot and turn that into a promo. We can play that for <laughs> for Sean's rest of studio. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so now you had found your people. You had others that you could fellowship with and and feel connected to theologically. What has happened since then? Yeah, suddenly I felt very connected. And one thing I really appreciated was how everybody debated everything. (laughs) I I don't like arguing. I especially hate, hateful arguing. I I can't stand it. Yeah. Um, But I appreciated the friendly debate on Facebook. But, you know, I had tried to find Unitarians around me, Mm -hmm. and I just couldn't. One thing that kept popping up was Christian Virtual Fellowship, which is a wing of allegiance to the king. Yeah, they're on the they're on the Unitarian Christian Alliance. You could find them if somebody wanted to look them up. Right. So uh, it kept popping up, and I really was hesitant. I didn't know anybody on there. I didn't know what it was like. So eventually, John actually reached out to me because I like to make videos about my personal thoughts and what God's showing me in the Word. Mm-hmm. And so I had mentioned Sykeston, and John Truett was like, whoa, that's like an hour and 15 minutes away from me. So he reached out to me. Mm. And I didn't realize Paducah was that close. I was like, oh my goodness, yes. 
So <laughs> I joined Christian Virtual Fellowship and loved it. It's a, on a Zoom platform. Yeah, And I have felt closer to these people than I ever have in any other fellowship, whether it be Bible study, in the boys' home, in a church. These guys are just awesome and super, wow. super open. We grow a lot. We call each other throughout the week. You know, I talk with a guy in the Philippines a lot. He's 14 hours different than I am. <laughs> and so it's really cool. We get to talk to each other and, and build each other up. So it's it's been really, really awesome. Well, I'm glad that you found a group that you can participate with, that you've really connected well with. It seems like they have a great outreach. Yeah. If you go on YouTube and type in Christian Virtual Fellowship, they've got tons and tons of topics and videos they've done. And basically, they record the teaching and part of the fellowship. There's a lot of stuff off the air that we build each other up with. We pray a lot. Mm. That kind of fellowship sometimes gets personal, so we don't put that out on the website. Well, that's good. That'll give somebody a taste of maybe if they've never done a virtual fellowship. This, this is what it's like. Exactly. Apart from the personal things. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so if somebody else has been struggling through something or if part of your story just really touches home and they want to reach out to you, Josiah, is, is there a way that you'd suggest they do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm already on the UCA page. I know you've said it many times, but I also highly, highly recommend it. If you haven't signed up for the Unitarian Christian Alliance, I really, really recommend it because there are so many people that do feel alone and if you get on the UCA website and find somebody near you, you can click on a link. That's easy for somebody. So okay. please sign up. And yeah, I'm on there. So if you click on the link, and it'll contact me. They just search for your name, Josiah Wright, in the directory. They would find you then. You used your full name? Right. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> well, that's great. Josiah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I wish you well in the next adventure of your life. Awesome. Thank you. And you as well. I received an email. Michael from Delaware writes, I love these podcasts that you do. It means so much to me to know that there are other biblical Unitarians out there. A bit of history on me, I was totally indoctrinated in the Trinity teaching for 60 years. I never heard anything else and didn't know there were born-again Christians that were monotheists. When Anthony Buzzard mentioned in a book that I was reading, Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven, That he didn't hold to the Trinity, I was shocked and thought to myself that he was some sort of cult leader. But I couldn't get over the fact that I loved his book, and he seemed to be very sincere and knowledgeable. So, with much fear and trembling, I began to investigate what the Bible had to say about the Trinity. This investigation took me about two years. Very slowly, I came to see that the Trinity teaching was not in the Bible and that Jesus was not God, and never said he was God. I certainly have a lot to learn and unlearn at 62 years old. These podcasts are a huge help. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. It's great to hear from you. I commend you for your willingness to actually look into the matter. The path is perilous, as I outlined in episode one. The fear is real. Why so much fear? That's a great question. I've touched on reasons why I think there is so much fear-mongering, and I'm sure we'll talk about it even more in future visits together. Michael, great to have you along. I know we get Trinitarian guests here. Perhaps you are a Trinitarian who doesn't quite get what the problem is. What is all this fuss? Well, not every Trinitarian reacts to us, Unitarian Christians, in the ways I've described in the UCA podcast. You may have caught episode 15, Why I'm Not a Trinitarian, and were rather perplexed at the things your fellow Christians say. If that's you, then you are likely one of those Trinitarians who thinks of the Trinity as a way of explaining God, and you recognize that it isn't a scriptural requirement. You, my friend, are not the reason this podcast exists. I know quite a few of you, My mother-in-law is one of you. Hi, Mom. She and I have delightful conversations wherein we disagree, but we energetically and with smiles on our faces discuss our thoughts. See, it can be done. And we grow. And we understand our own views better when we partake in this kind of back and forth. And sometimes we find we have a view that may be overstated or a bit strained. Maybe it's one of these compatible verses, which we have over-eagerly elevated to proof, 
episode 19. These conversations can help us realize we're doing that, so we can correct it. Most of us, I'm confident, want to have sound reasons for believing what we believe. This audience, at least, I'm pretty sure, would not want to have a misunderstanding about a verse and then go around spouting it off as proof. That's just embarrassing. This audience hears that kind of stuff a lot, as mentioned in the last episode, number 19, a lot. I've even tried to help in the past to let someone know of an actual error in what they were teaching, like misquoting scripture, very basic stuff. Well, (laughs) that's the beauty of being in the majority. You can get away with ignoring those pesky details. Everyone in the room is going to give you a hearty amen. Why worry so much, right? We want to have a sound faith and a solid framework. And having conversations with people who love Scripture and love to think about it is a blessing. So, to you delightful Trinitarians who likewise recognize that there are, in fact, various views on this, to you who at least recognize that Paul didn't personally write the Chalcedonian Creed, to you, I say thanks. And I know at least one of you is thinking, ah, Mark believes that truth is relative and there's no absolute truth and blah, blah, blah. No, I believe there is absolute truth. And our job is to always be willing to listen, to seek. If you call out for insight, and if you raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We are here with this podcast and the UCA because we often cannot have these dialogues, these wonderful back and forths, like the ones I have with my mother-in-law. We are here because instead of dialogue, we get silence, condemnation, and worse. To you Trinitarians, who are probably already being judged for being soft on truth, I appreciate you. I hope to meet more of you in the future. For now, thanks for stopping by and subjecting yourself to some of my humor and for being interested enough to look outside your own circles. Regarding the last episode, number 19, Credibility and God's Death, I got this short note. Dale from Tennessee writes, The UCA podcast is absolutely on fire. I grinned through the first part, laughed my way through the whole second part, and grinned for different reasons all the way through the third part. Seriously, I was walking around the neighborhood while walking the dog, chuckling to myself like some kind of maniac. (laughs) Wow. I'm not sure if I should be glad or apologize. Thanks for the note, though. That episode was a lot of fun. And knowing that it's appreciated and enjoyed means a lot to me. Reminder, if you haven't looked at the UCA membership map yet, what are you waiting for? Pause now and make a note to check it out, unitarianchristianalliance.org. The map is right there. Click it and explore all the postal codes where UCA members live. You don't even have to be a member to see it. You only have to be a member if you want to make use of the directory to reach out and make connections which I hope you do. We also have an email list. Get additional thoughts from me and a larger view of the episode art. If you keep wondering what I mean by episode art, I give each episode its own image. Some podcast players don't make the art very obvious. If you haven't seen them, then you're missing out. Doing the art is a nice change of pace for me from all the audio editing. Sign up for the email on podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. Here's what's in store for future episodes, a visit with the UCA video mastermind and living in an alien world, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Thanks, Josiah. I appreciate getting to know you, your friendship, and I appreciate that desire to seek God, which ultimately led you to your closet. Oh, also, I'm sorry I waited so long to release this. See, when Josiah and I did this interview... It was January, almost three months ago. When he and I talked back then, episode five, uh, did God put coal in my stocking, was still pretty recent. Josiah's closet story fits really well with episode five. If you haven't heard that yet, I might suggest that one.
May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. Available now, the neti pot of podcasts. She pointed me to Sean Finnegan's Restitutio podcast that I listened to the snot out of. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great.